This is David Roach. Uh, I wanted to talk to you about Zelensky's uh, visit to uh, Washington. Uh, the general consensus is that this provided what is needed. Uh, and in some ways it did. But I think overall, my assessment would be very negative. Now, here is the reason why. What Zelensky brought back from Washington was, of course, on the good side, uh, shoring up of support to the tune of 49 or $50 uh, billion dollars next year for the Ukrainian economic and war effort. Uh, what he brought back, therefore, was a vote of confidence in his rule of Ukraine and the prosecution of the war against uh, Russia. But these were not hammer blows to Russia. Essentially, it was the agreement to supply Ukraine with more ammunition, which of course is sorely needed, and with better air defense systems. Why does that not actually fit the bill? It does not fit the bill because if Ukraine was equipped with ATACMSs, in other words, long range tactical uh, missiles, which would have uh, a range of around 300, 400 kilometers, then Ukraine would be able to cut the link between Russia and Crimea by land. <clears throat> it would do so by advancing towards Melitopol and taking it. And secondly, uh, it would be able to hit every single Russian base on the Crimean Peninsula uh, from even quite remote uh, launch sites from the actual front. And the result would be a crippling blow to Moscow's hold in Crimea. Now, whatever one thinks about the offenses in uh, Donbass and Luhansk, where the Russians are bogged down, but throwing in more and more bodies to be to the slaughter. The blow to Putin of actually losing Crimea is, in my view, uh, potentially fatal. And I think he would be gone within months of losing Crimea. Now, the argument raised by the US side, and particularly by uh, the Secretary for Security was that, of course, we can train Ukrainians to handle the HIMAR air defense systems, each of which requires, each unit requires 90 people. But there is no capacity to train Ukrainians for offensive ATA CMS type missiles at the same time. Having talked to people a lot younger than me and smarter than me in the military, not only in Ukraine, but other European powers militaries, particularly Baltic and Polish state who are engaged in Ukraine, this argument is rubbish. It does not hold. There is plenty of capacity to train Ukrainians in air defense systems and in the use of highly sophisticated offensive weaponry at the same time. The reason why that decision was not taken to do so is because we are still fighting this war uh, based on Russian rules. We do not want to provoke the Kremlin too far. We do not want to corner Putin. We do not want him to escalate beyond the bounds of what we are prepared to, to bear. Therefore, what we do is to arm Ukraine not to lose this war, but we do not arm Ukraine to win this war. Now, what that actually means is, like in tennis or any other sport, if you play a defensive game, you will ultimately lose the game. And that is the biggest risk in Ukraine. It is that the war of attrition, which we are pre-ordinating, will end up by actually causing more damage to Ukraine 
than it will to Russia. And that China then moves to back Russia more openly as a successful warmonger and as an enemy of an international system based on the rule of law. And we end up with a global situation which is sadly deteriorated. That is the major risk. The more likely outcome is that this time next year, if I am still around, I will be giving you the same message of the bogging down of the war in Ukraine. Probably it's prosecution with immense losses on the Ukrainian side towards Melitopol, making Putin's position more and more fragile, but not making Putin's position decisively disastrous, which is what we should be doing. There is no way in which the Ukrainian war can be won passively. It can only be won offensively and decisively with the defeat of Russia. Now, where are we going? Okay, well, obviously, in the scenario which I paint of a prolonged war of attrition with risks of the Ukrainians being on the losing side of that war of attrition, but more likely they will slowly manage to advance towards Melitopol, making the final outcome of Putin extremely negative. But it is going to be a prolonged war. Europe is on the forefront of that war. It will test European solidity. It will promote new leadership in the European Union, at least intellectually, by the Baltic states and by Poland, with Germany and France being seen as having been laggardly, intellectually indecisive, and haunted by their own histories to an extent which was totally unjustified. That is a big change. But unfortunately, getting there, even if we do, in terms of preserving European unity under renewed, at least, leadership, the cost to the European economy in the next year will be very high. And I would not bet on a resurgent euro, though I think um, there will be a continued trend for the euro to stabilize around 160, 180 against the US dollar at some point. I rephrase that, 106, 108 against the US dollar at some point will be the range trading of the euro as the appeal of the US dollar in terms of relative interest rates and in terms of uh, safe haven status will diminish over the year to some extent, unless Putin is seen as winning this war, which is not impossible, but I would still put a 20% probability. But there is very little appeal in European equity assets because the economy will continue to suffer from the effects of the war. Furthermore, the ECB is likely to over tighten, which will cost the economy in real terms. And it will probably mean that European bonds, although not falling out of bed, and I certainly don't see a continuation of the war as being something that will uh, undermine the euro to a substantial effect, I think policy will be oriented more and more towards trying to make Europe more solid. Uh, if the war is more prolonged. In other words, there will be more fiscal latitude. Uh, there will be more backing of countries like Italy. And of course, the ECB has got its new weapon, which would allow it to buy Italian bonds if it considers that the yields had, uh, had, uh, were at spreads to Germany, which were too large. Uh, and this it can be done provided Italy has not breached any specific uh, EU rules about its long-term uh, fiscal uh, conservatism. So if we looked into the next year, it is quite likely that we are going to see a Europe which in terms of its economy, in terms of interest rate policy, which will be tougher than in the US, as lagging, uh, any global recovery. 
and as continuing to pay the price of what is basically global indecisiveness on behalf of democracies in dealing uh, with Russia on the issue of Ukraine. Goodbye, good night, and don't turn off the lights.